everyone. Um, quick poll to start. Who knows who that guy on the right is? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Sorry, what? Hmm? Anyway, that is uh, Captain Chesley Sullenberger, <laughs> who landed this plane in the Hudson River a few years ago. Um, so technically, that's a glider. That's not the type of glider I want to talk to you, uh, talk to you about, though. Uh, this is. If you squint, you can see me actually in the cockpit of that. That's pretty fun. So these things are called sailplanes. And the first question I always get is, how do you not instantly crash without an engine? And if you've ever thrown a paper plane, it's basically the same thing. So you continuously exchange altitude for the airspeed that you need to fly. Um, so eventually, you will hit the ground, or you will land. Um, and then again, my personal record has been flying for 10 hours and 52 minutes. Um, but in a glider without an engine, without landing in between. How does that work? I found a great clip on YouTube, actually, that explains this. Um, so essentially, you could see the stove that's heating up the air, and then the plane just circles in that heating up air, and the air rises, and the glider with it. Um, so in reality, it looks more like this. Um, what we use is the sun basically it warms up the ground, that heats up the air, and the air rises, and we circle inside of that. And you can see several other planes in that so-called thermal climb, uh, climbing rhythm. Uh, this video is from a gliding competition from last year. Um, the way gliding competitions work is, at, in the morning, every pilot gets a task. So start at the starting line, go to turn point A, turn point B, turn point C, and then to the finish line. These tasks are usually 200, 300 miles. Uh, you use several hours for that. Um, and then basically the pilot who finishes that task first, or as fastest, wins the competition day. And we have about one or two weeks of competition, so in the end all the scores add up, and the winner is the one with the most score. Gliding competitions have one major problem though. For spectators on the ground, you don't really see a lot because you see the planes taking off and land, but if they fly away 200 miles, you don't really see them. Um, so my personal goal was to find solutions to this. Um, the early solutions was using radio calls, but that doesn't work if you do it like every second. So you do it like every half an hour to give you an idea where everyone is, but it's not really that great and the precision is also not that good. There's this other thing called short messages, but it's like if you're texting the whole time, <laughs> it's just not good, don't do it. Um, so with smartphones, it got a lot better. Um, there are several apps now that can transmit your location data to servers on the ground. Um, you can use special apps for gliding. You can use WhatsApp, you can use Google Maps, whatever. Uh, but they have several issues. One of them is at high altitude, you just don't have a great reception and things just don't arrive at the ground. And the other thing, it quickly drains your battery, so that's not that good either. There is another system, though, and that's using a device called FLARM, which is short, I think, for FLARM, a flight alarm. Um, it's essentially a collision avoidance system. So the way it works is it transmits your GPS location to all nearby devices, and by nearby, I mean two, three miles, roughly. And that's enough to give collision avoidance data to all the, all the other airplanes. It gets more interesting when we use ground stations though, because with proper antennas on the ground, we can reach ranges up to 30, 40 miles. Uh, so you can see all the planes that are flying around your airport, for example. And it gets even more interesting if we link those up to the internet. So now we can actually see gliders flying on the other side of the country, on the map in the browser, which is really awesome. But it has one major problem. So by the way, this thing is called OGN, it's short for Open Glider Network. Um, it has one major problem, these servers only speak TCP. And in a browser, you, well, browsers do speak TCP, but you don't get access to a raw TCP socket. So that's not good. So we had to build something that translates from TCP socket data, uh, TCP messages, to something that we can use in the browser. In this case, we decided to use WebSockets because it's the easiest. Um, so what we built is called OGN Web Gateway. Um, in the end, it looks something like this. I brought a screenshot. I would show it live to you. The problem is the flight season in Europe hasn't started yet, and time zones also make it difficult. Uh, so the, app right, uh, the, the map right now is pretty empty. Um, but this is roughly how it works. So you can see all the planes flying around there. There is a experimental 3D version too, but I'm not gonna show that for now. Um, 
Yeah, so we built that in Rust, actually, and we used a framework called Actix. Um, it's describing itself as the most fun web framework. I mean, it's Rust, and we've already heard about the borrow checker. <laughs> it can be frustrating, but it worked amazingly well. Um, so the way we've modeled it is we have the supervisor actor. That's basically the main thing that does everything. And that starts up three separate actors. We have the OGN actor, which is the one that connects to the OGN server network and receives messages from all the planes that are flying around. We've, we have the gateway actor in the middle. Um, that is responsible for basically the business logic of um, forwarding to all the other web sockets. Uh, sockets. And then we have the HTTP actor, which is basically the server that accepts connections. As I said, the OGN actor receives messages from the OGN servers and forwards them to the gateway actor. And then the HTTP actor, it basically starts up a new actor for every connection that it receives. And those actors are stateful. So for WebSocket connections, that's quite helpful. And then these connection actors, they register themselves with the gateway. So the gateway knows, OK, if I am receiving a OGN message from the OGN actor, I want to forward it to those uh, connection actors. And it's bidirectional because the WebSocket clients can actual, actually filter what kind of updates they want. So for specific aircraft, for a certain geographical window, et cetera. Um, that, so that is the live API. We also have built in a history API that you can query to get the latest, so the, basically the location data of the last 24 hours for several aircraft. Um, we first built that using Postgres with a timescale DB extension because I thought, well, this is a typical time series payload. It turned out it was quite a problematic. Um, so at the busiest day last year, we had about 20 million records in there for the last 24 hours. Um, at some point, we started reaching query times of 20 seconds. That was not so good. Um, so I had to rewrite that. I talked to a few friends, and they recommended to use Redis with a time bucket approach. Um, it took a few evenings, and then I got it working, and, well, it was a big success. We are now at 20 milliseconds, so that was good. <laughs> um, the other part of the project is the OGN Web Viewer, so basically the front end to the, to the back end, which is the web gateway. Um, it's available at OGN Cloud if you want to try it out. As I said, the map is probably pretty empty right now, but it works pretty well. Um, it's written in Ember, and it has another cool feature, and that is live scoring that you can see at the bottom. Um, so I think this is probably th the first project that tried that. We are now able, with just that collision avoidance data, to predict what the scores of the competition in the end will be um, while the planes are still flying. And this was really great. I was uh, helping a friend on the ground and working on the system in parallel. And it was quite amazing to see everything basically worked out. We were able to get the proper scores. We were able to predict up to, I think, the, the second point, decimal point of the speed in the end. So well, that was pretty cool. Yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. And if you want to know more about gliding or the things we've built, let me know. <laughs>